Hey, hey, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Thanks, Squarespace. Yay. Hey, wow. Hi. My name is Thomas Brush. I'm the creator of a game called Pinstripe, also a game called Neversong. You can take a look at those games in the links in the description. I've been making indie games for about a decade, and one of the biggest hurdles that most game developers talk about is the struggle of not actually finishing their games. Always starting something, but never really knowing how to bring it to completion and start making some money. I had an incredible chat with this guy named David Whaley, and he created a game called The First Tree. And he talks about compromising your vision. And that sounds like a really horrible thing to do, right? You wouldn't want to compromise your vision. But he actually makes a really good point. And that is that it is very important for indie game developers to be willing to bring down the level of expectations they have for themselves and their game to ensure that they actually finish what they're working on. You may have a perfect unfinished product or a product that is has been compromised, but it's been finished. So I want to show you guys a portion of this conversation I had with David. Okay guys, before we get started, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Believe it or not, I've been wanting Squarespace as a sponsor for so long, mainly because Squarespace is awesome. <laughs> I've been using Squarespace for, I think, six years. Um, both my websites, thomasbrush.com and atmosgames.com, where I host my games and my portfolio, my resume, all that cool stuff is hosted on Squarespace. It was created with Squarespace. Squarespace is cool because you can look amazing. You can have custom designs and pretty much do anything you need to do um, for your business or your own personal brand, all with Squarespace, and you don't have to know how to code. So if you guys are interested in creating a website um, with Squarespace, click the link below, squarespace.com slash Thomas Brush, and use the promo code Thomas Brush for 10% off. Yay, yay, I love Squarespace, I really do. <laughs> Thanks, Squarespace. I tell some of my viewers too, I'm like, it's okay to compromise your vision yeah. if you're getting like 90% of the way there. Like if you're almost there and it's not totally perfect, then finish it anyway because finishing and releasing a game is by far the best way to learn. That's how you Absolutely. teach yourself game dev is to finish a project because it, it takes discipline. Like making the first tree and then being a dad and working full time, it was it was not fun after a while. No. And that's why, that's why I, I totally agree with you. Like if you're just single and you're going to school or something, that is like the season to just dive in yeah. and work your butt off. It's, yeah, it's, it, it was hard. I, I even like right now I'm thinking back on, I'm like, how did I do that? I don't know. I feel the same way, man. Like I was, and I was a bad husband at the time. We didn't have kids when I was making pinstripe. Like you can ask my wife, I was so involved and so obsessed with getting everything perfect with that game. And I look back on it, like you said, you've got to compromise. Uh, and I want I want your audience and I want my audience to know like it's it's the it's similar to the feeling of like uh, when you're in a fight with a family member or you're in a fight with a friend or your your spouse or something, it's really heated and you're seeing red, right? Mm -hmm. And you just yeah. want you want to win that argument. That same feeling is the is what it is for me when I want to get something right with a game. I'm not I'm not necessarily <laughs> yeah. rational I'm not necessarily rational in decision making. And so I look back on all the decision decisions I made with Pinstripe and I'm like, why did I spend so much time on those things? Like little tiny things to make it my way. And and I look back on it and I'm like, people don't care about those tiny little things. Now obviously it's a balance. Like if you had decided to not make the fox in in First Tree look so beautiful. Then and just it, I I think the fox is really what sold that game. Mm, um, yeah. And by the way, if my audience doesn't know, that game is really popular on Switch, Steam. Did you release on Xbox and PS4? Yeah, it's on not yeah. on mobile, but everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. So you're in terms of like success, like you've you've nailed it, and you've you've done a really good job with with promoting that game and selling it, but. If you hadn't Thank focused you. on, if you hadn't focused on, I think if you hadn't focused on making that that fox as beautiful as it was, then I don't think that game would have sold as well as it did. Um, so there's certain things to not compromise on, and certain things mm -hmm. to compromise on. 
and understanding where those things should be compromised, I think is what, what separates the great developers from the failed ones. Mm. Yeah. I, I really like that thought. It's, and I think a way to figure out what you can and can't skip is to release games. And that's my first game. Yeah. It was a financial failure. Like I was happy I did it, but it, I wasn't quitting my job. I was like, okay, I'll just keep doing my thing. That's cool. <laughs> but what it taught yeah. me, it taught me things. And I was able to use that data. It was it was real data to say, okay, here's what I did wrong. I yeah. didn't market it. I didn't have a lead character to rally around like a fox. It was a first person game. Um, that yeah. made it that made a huge difference. Um, mm. It wasn't as colorful. And I think those things that helps grab attention in a Steam thumbnail. It was it was lots yeah. of little things. And I guess. Maybe, you know, I think every game developer has to be an entrepreneur of some kind, but I am like, I'm very analytical and I'm saying like, okay, that didn't work here. Why didn't that, why did that not work? And it was satisfying to be like, I made a list of like, okay, here's the stuff I want to fix for the first tree. Like I want to market it regularly. I want the, I want want to spend a lot of time on the Fox because that's the whole, that's the focal point of the whole game. Um, But other things I was like, okay, I can't can't do that. I can't compose all the music. Um, I'm going to license the music. I can't do the sound yeah. effects and go out in my backyard and like make jumping sound effects with rocks or whatever. I have to license those. It was, yeah. it was a lot of stuff and it's still, and you, you might, you might not like this Thomas, but um, <laughs> I thought I was terrified of using all the assets because I just knew everyone would know. Right. Yeah, everyone totally. would. I, everyone I totally would, know the feeling. Everyone would know. I was like, oh, I'm an I'm an asset flipper. Even though I tried hard to right. modify, I tried really hard to modify them, but it was still the same geometry, same meshes. Yeah, but the, well, the reason why I don't do asset, like I've I've pretty much decided I'm probably not going to do it. Be an asset flip kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why I don't is is because the things that I'm really gifted at are are illustrate. Like I don't know where your giftings are. Or where your talents are it's probably storytelling um and setting the mood those things and you also said you're really interested in music yeah I'm, like i'm not really sure where all of your where you believe all of your skill sets are but for me it's definitely in the art side of things mm-hmm. and so i feel like it would be a mistake for me to to pull away from where i'm gifted and what really separates my style out from others mm-hmm. but the thing is is that i'm totally fine using assets that are like code assets right. and back end assets. So it, my, what I tell my audience is find out where your gifting is, where you're talented and lean heavily into that, making that custom, but everything else that you feel like you're not your strong suits. It's just like a regular business, right? You need to mm-hmm. outsource it. You need to hire people. Well, in, in our case, we can't really probably can't afford to hire a couple people for our studios. So, go quote unquote hire people by just buying their assets on the asset store. And they, they actually will, they will help you out. Like if you email these developers, you just spent $20 on an asset. And I learned this from you, by the way, because we had a meeting in, uh, I think it was a year ago and you told me all about your, your mentality with assets. Mm -hmm. I started downloading certain assets that I use now and I'll email these developers and they will treat me like that. I'm their boss almost. They'll, they'll help me out and write custom stuff for that asset and help yeah. me out, which is insane. You're using third person controller, right? By Opsiv? Yeah, I was. I was okay. using that. Um, it, there he was a helped, couple things. That, he he did he really? so much with the Fox yeah. issues because I was like one of the first people to put a quadruped, an animal, as the controller. <laughs> And he was Did like, really? yeah, like, and he, he added That's stuff awesome. later to make it more compatible, but I found out a lot of stuff. And so he helped me a ton. And I, I like to think maybe I, I gave him some information so he can make the asset better. And yeah, but no, you're, you're, t- you're totally right. And that's, that's the cool part about this internet age is there's all these resources and you're helping these other developers and they make a living by selling in bulk, right? They sell by quantity right. with these right. licensing, these assets. And it's cool. Like you can go to all these like freesound.org. Like a lot of them just ask to be credited and you have, you have whole sound studios and musicians and everything at your fingertips, right on, right from the internet. It's this, it's this new age of just, 
you know, you can be a one man mega studio in a way by getting by like crowdsourcing all these people's help and paying paying them what they request, which is usually like, I don't know, 50 bucks for a Unity asset or 50 bucks for a yep. licensing a song yep. on Audio Jungle or Pond 5 or whatever. So it's, right. it's exciting. Right. And yeah, and I was going to say about, you know, I was always terrified about the environment packs, like everyone would notice. And the, the, Nobody fact, did. the fact is, you know, I read maybe 10,000 comments over the course of a few years, <laughs> like from Reddit and You're emails brave. and Twitter. I, yeah. not, not all of them, but only like a handful, like five to 10 people said, oh, that's that, that's that nature pack from Unity. Right. No one, no one right. really cared. And, and Pinstripe, <laughs> I, I loved Pinstripe. I played it with my girl. Like I'd, oh, get, thank Ev- you. I'd get Evelyn on my, on my lap and we'd go play. I'd be like, hey, what game do you want to oh, play? Really? Yeah. I'd be like, we could play um, East Shade or we could play this game. And she always said, Pinstripe. I want to play Pinstripe. <laughs> and I, as an artist, I noticed all your touches and I was amazed by it. And right. that's why you're one of my favorite devs. But oh, I just, I, and I want you to like, yeah, to know like, it's hard because the lay person, like the gamer who just wants to have a good time and feel some feels, you know, go on a feels yeah. trip or whatever. Cause yeah. I make, I make emotional games. I think you have, you make games with a lot of heart too. They're story driven. Right. Right. I think and I think people, that's what, that's, that's what they want. Well, it depends. Like it really depends on, on where you, where your target market is. Like right now, I think my, I've made two, I've made two like, feels games like that have heavy stories very emotional poignant endings and i think what i'm gonna do and you've kind of gone down this path as well is i want to try and make some money in the game industry this year and like make this year like maybe that's not what you're doing but like in terms of making you know your your courses but for me this year i want to focus on the business side of things the entrepreneurship side of things of how do I maybe maybe do a little bit of experimentation? So for me, I'm going to try and hit like four games or three games in the next year and a half. Just pop them wow, out. Like that's awesome. Fun little fun little short games um, because I want to see I want to see what happens. Right. I mean, I think it's important for game developers to. This is something I was actually wanting to talk to you about is I'm. I'm of the opinion that game developers, indie game developers, tend to take themselves way too seriously. Mm. Um, like for me, I used to be like, I'm gonna be a prophet of the game industry. Like I'm gonna make, <laughs> be, or like a poet. Like I'm gonna be the one who makes games that really hit people in the feels and change people's lives. And what I've learned is, I think I'm taking myself a little bit too seriously. I think I just need to make games and people are gonna enjoy them. And maybe I'll look back one day and say that, you know, it was better for me to focus on super highly emotional games that change the world as opposed to just fun games, you know, Mm -hmm. short, fun games. Maybe I'll look back and say that. But right now, I don't know the answer. I don't know what my role is or my calling is in the game industry. And I think that, uh, like you said, it's important to just release games and not take yourself so seriously. Like for you, you could have been really cocky and said, I'm not going to use any assets from the asset store. But instead you were like, no, I just need to get this done. And I think that that is what I think that is the minority of game developers, the way that they think most Mm -hmm. game developers are way too principled. They, they care way too much about doing things from scratch and it leads them to never release stuff and never finish Mm -hmm. stuff. You know? I think I think those principles can be if you're too stubborn with your principles, it can be dangerous if it never leads to you finishing and releasing a game. Right. And yeah, I I used, you know, I used to beat myself up a lot. I think every creative they have the imposter syndrome. Yeah. And and of course I did cuz you know, I was just trying I was like, you know, throwing this stuff together cuz I wanted to tell my story, but it wasn't as it wasn't high art enough. It wasn't, it wasn't principled in, enough. And me and my wife, she's an artist and you know, she's a traditional artist. She does collage with a uh, paper and it's fine art. Oh, that's awesome. And she's, she's, she's awesome. She's done, you know, she's in galleries and stuff. And we have these conversations all the time. Like what's the balance between art and commercialization? And it's, it's hard. I, I don't, I don't know if I know all the answers, but I know like, 
I love telling my story. I love, I, I don't want to rip people off, but I want to use these resources available from the asset store and I want to make them yeah. original somehow. And I, I don't, and I would rather a game that's imperfect be released than not released at all. And then no one would know that story, even if it was, even if it's not as high art or as principled, principled as other games, if you, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And that was like kind of the decisions yeah. I had to make. Those are the, I call them like compromising your vision a little bit. And I, I'm glad I yeah. did because if I didn't, my life would have never changed from releasing my imperfect, honest, you know, beautiful game, The First Tree. Yeah.